Oh, the value of a father's blessing. And if you're privileged to receive a mantle from your father, I'll bring that into scriptural context in a few minutes. But oh, the value of the blessing of a father. I kind of share some of these simple things this morning with a heavy heart because the truth is we live in a world where there's lots of prodigal fathers. So I want to speak on this with extreme sensitivity. I know too that there are heavy hearts for past failures as fathers. I talked to a man this morning that I dearly love who said Father's Day is hard for him because he wasn't around much for his father and didn't feel prior to the Lord he was a very good father. So Father's Day is a sad day for him. It's a reminder to him. But I attempted to remind him that we serve a God who can make beauty for ashes and who can take five years of fatherhood under the surrender of Jesus Christ and make it better than 25 years. God's about restoring, starting us over. So I'm going to draw some lines in the sand this morning, hopefully in the 30 minutes or so that I speak and share the value of the blessing of the Father. But I am sensitive to the fact that there are a number here in this service who have recently come to the Lord. And you haven't been a Christian during your child raising years. So my prayer is that you'll receive this, recognize its needful things to be said, and that um, God is the one who restores. I had an incredible advantage, incredible advantage of a father's blessing as well as a mantle. I have written here, I got both. And in a moment I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by a mantle, a spiritual blessing from a father, a mantle. The value of a father's blessing. My father, many, many times, he didn't call me in like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and have me kneel on the floor and lay his hand and say, it's time to pronounce the blessing. He didn't say it in the way that some of the Old Testament writers we read of did. But many, many, many times I have vivid memory in the last 10 years or so of his life, he would take advantage of prayer with me and bless me. And I feel honored that he did I can recall being by his bed when he was sick, and he would pray to bless Tom, bless his ministry, bless every message that he preaches, bless his family, bless his sons, bless his future grandchildren. And his guy was blessed to receive a blessing from my father. And that's a valuable thing. And I need to say to you too that I have such advantage because I also received a mantle from my father, which I believe to be a spiritual passing on of anointing. I'm not suggesting, friends, that the anointing of the Holy Spirit is biological. I'm not suggesting that. But what I am saying is that I believe that if you have an anointed father and you follow the Lord as his son, that he can pass along some spiritual blessing that's over and above just the thing we're talking about, the blessing and favor of the father. I believe a mantle can be given you. And I say with, with gratitude beyond repair, or, or beyond compare, I never will forget when my father told me, he said, Tom, your preaching gift that the Lord gave me, he's speaking of himself, he said, I have sensed that God is passing that on to you. And I remember how I felt that I was receiving his mantle. And Lord, my response to that was, oh Lord, don't, don't let me, don't let me fall short. I humbly received that, but don't let me fall short as I saw my father very much as a prophetic mouthpiece for the Lord and was used in incredible ways despite all of his weaknesses. It's amazing how God uses us. And may I say to you this morning, if you present your weakness, lay it down as Amber, Amber sang. If you present your weakness, I give you my weakness. I bring my weakness before you. God's strength is made perfect in weakness. And in some of my weakest moments in life, I've seen that mantle come into play. Sundays when I thought we were going through things in the family, I thought, how in the world will I preach this morning? Sometimes I gave messages that the whole week, 40 or 50 people would contact me in various ways by text or word and say, that touched me that morning. I recognized that in my weakness, God used the blessing and mantle. 
Bring your weakness and surrender. I could go off on that real easy, but I want to talk about the value of the Father's blessing. To get the full extent of what a scriptural blessing in the history in the Bible of the blessing throughout the Old Testament, we see fathers blessing their sons. And I think the best story of this, and it's a very long story, and obviously we can't read it all this morning, but to kind of catch uh, what the blessing of the father meant, the story in Genesis 27, I think, helps us get it, of what it meant to them. And actually, this story is uh, especially interesting because it's entitled, Jacob Gets uh, Isaac's Blessing, and you know Esau was supposed to get the first blessing because he was the oldest. And Jacob, with the coercing of his mother, uh, Rebekah, actually schemed to get the blessing for Jacob, the younger son. And interesting story, we'll not read it all, but Esau was instructed by Isaac to go out and find some venison. Ah, oh, man, after my own heart. <laughs> go out and find some venison and bring back venison that my soul loveth. I have fun with that sometimes in deer season. Hands so tired of deer meat, and I'll say venison like my soul loveth. That's right, that's true. But Esau went out to hunt and bring back venison for Isaac because they were going to have a special meal. Once you get the idea of the blessing, uh, we've, we've lost this along the way. But historically in Scripture, this was a powerful moment, the blessing of the Father. But there's something for us in this this morning. And so Isaac told Esau, go out and get the venison that my soul loves and bring it back and we'll eat together and I'm going to bless you. Rebecca overhears the story, calls Jacob in and says, Jacob. I have heard that your father, who is nearly blind, is getting ready, or was blind at that point, is getting ready to give his blessing. I want you to have a blessing. And Jacob, which means deceiver, Jacob and her coerced together, and he kind of argued with her first. He said, wait a minute, Esau, my brother, is a man with lots of hair, and a hairy man, and I'm a smooth man. How are we going to fool him? And they killed a goat. Things haven't changed much. Deception. And put the hide of the goat around his neck in places that they thought that Isaac might touch him to see who he was. And Jacob got all ready with the coercing of his mother and came in while Esau was out hunting to get the blessing. And verse 22 of Genesis 27 says, Jacob went close to his father Isaac who touched him and said, The voice, the voice is of Jacob. Who felt blind and reached out to his son, getting ready to give him a blessing? He said, the voice is of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him, for his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau, so he blessed him. Are you really my son Esau, he asked? I am, he replied. Then he said, my son, bring me some of your game to eat so that I may give you my blessing. Jacob brought it to him, and he ate, because they had prepared a goat and spiced it and seasoned it in a way. And he brought some wine for him to drink, for, to drink. And then his father Isaac said, Come here, my son, and kiss me. So when he went and kissed him, when Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, See, he was all fixed up like Esau, hid his clothes, the goat's hair. He had the smell of the outdoors on him. So when he went in and kissed him, and when Isaac saw and caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, Ah, oh, the smell of my son is like the smell of the field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you, here's the blessing, may God give you of heaven's dew and of the earth's richness and the abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and people bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may the son of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed and those who bless you be blessed. And after Isaac finished blessing him, Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence and his brother Esau came in for money. He too had prepared some tasty food and he brought it to his father. And he said, my father said, I need some of my game so that you may give me a blessing. And his father answered, who are you? Why, well, I am your son, your firstborn Esau. Isaac trembled violently and said, who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came, and I blessed him, and indeed he will be blessed. And when Esau heard his father's words, he burst out in a loud and bitter cry, and said to his father, Bless me, me too, my father. There's 
setting the stage for how important the blessing was. We've lost this summer. We've lost this summer. He said, your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. And Esau said, isn't he right to be in jail? He has deceived me these two times. Remember before when he sold his birthright? He took my birthright and now he's taken my blessing. Then he asked, haven't you reserved any blessing for me? And Isaac answered Esau, I have made him Lord over you. Interesting how people's word meant something. Boy, hasn't that changed. Sad. I'm so heavy hearted the last couple of weeks that I can hardly function just to be totally honest. God is revealing to me in almost a prophetic way, giving me thoughts of what's coming. And some of that's come out in messages. But with that heaviness and a recognition of where we are, I've had a sadness of spirit like I haven't had for years. And it's a recognition. Isaac answered, he saw I have made him Lord over you, and have made him all his relatives and servants, and I have sustained him with grain and new wine. So what can I possibly do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, do you have just but one blessing? My father bless me too, my father. Then Esau wept aloud. We're going to stop there. There's an, and I encourage you to read the rest of that story. He did give a blessing to Esau, but he did in the context of being under Jacob. He'd already given his word. All right. Stay with me now. This is going to be good stuff. 2 Kings. In 2 Kings now, the mantle. Now I'm going to read 2 Kings 2, 9 through 14. Esau, excuse me, Elisha. Elisha had almost been an annoyance to Elijah. Elijah had been mentoring Elisha. And we can tell from the passage that uh, it's almost been annoying to Elijah because Elisha just keeps following everywhere because Elisha knows that Elijah is about to die. And he wants his mantle. And he says, I'm going with it. And if I can paraphrase a little bit, Elijah says, he says, where are you going? He says, I'm going to Walmart. And he says, I'm going to. He says, just sit here. You don't need to go to Walmart. No, I'm going to Walmart if you're going to Walmart. And so they go to Walmart together. And if I can paraphrase a little bit, now where are you going? I'm going to AutoZone. I'm going to. And, and he's like, oh, for heaven's sake, can I even buy an oil filter with that? <laughs> Bottom line, he follows him everywhere. And finally, Elijah says, what is it that you want? And he said, I want a double portion of what you got. Guys, gals, I'm scouting as a pastor for people that want a double portion. I can't tell you how exciting spiritually it is to me to see people come on board with a hunger. And they've had the cars, and they've had the stuff, and they've had the decent incomes, and they've had all the stuff, but they want more now. And they talk to you, and there's something in their eye, and they want it. And when you pray with them, they say, I, I, I want what you got, or she's got, or he's got. I, I, want, I want that spiritual thing in my life. I saw something in Pastor Bishop. I saw something in my father. You talk about being mentored. Man, I, I have to toe the line. <laughs> too much is given, much is required. My two mentors were Pastor Bishop and Jack Robbins. <laughs> and I got, I got to do this well, boys and girls. I've got to do this well. <laughs> too much is given, much is required. And Elisha had a hunger for Elijah. And that's missing today. That's missing today so many places. I see it arriving some to our ministry here. It's been refreshing to me. I had a point in the ministry where I almost just felt like quitting. Not quitting on the Lord, but I thought there's no hunger. People just want to watch TV. They just want to hang out. They, just, they don't have a hunger, and we're not going to get them to have it. But you stand on your head, scream, jump over the altar, and do flip-flops and everything else, and they still don't have a hunger, and you can't get them to do it. That's what prompted the name not a church. I thought maybe if we come at this from their direction. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we come at this from their direction. And I don't think that's the name we were supposed to stay with. And it was misunderstood by many. But that's where that was coming from. But it's refreshing to see. We're kind of in a season now where I think people are looking around at world conditions and they're recognizing, oh boy, 
There's a lot of things changing. The climate is changing. I gotta get things right with the Lord. I gotta get on board. I, I gotta be able to hide and, and go to that refuge in the song we sang for Jesus this morning. I gotta I gotta go to that rock of ages. Boy, we better get some things shored up, and that's that's scriptural. Because in Matthew 25, the five wise, five foolish virgins, gotta get the oil, gotta get this lamp going, gotta get things trimmed. The the, the wick trimmed and that light bright. Elisha had a hunger. I'm gonna read 9 through 14. When he had crossed. Elijah said to Elisha, tell me, what can I do for you before I'm taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. Oh, you've asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours. Boy, he's going to stick to me. He said, if you see me go, you're going to get it. <laughs> oh, man. I'm sorry, but you're going to get real tired of me now. Because I'm going to stick to you like glue. And they were walking along and talking together, and suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. And <laughs> can I stop here? I'll have to stop there for it. Don't hang on so tight to this world. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the joy. That's a hit. Don't hang on too tight. I want to live. And I have a desire to live. But boy, i got a longing to go too. The more I get to know the Lord, I see some of you shaking me. Let me understand. And when I was in the hospital, I got to be honest with you, 10 years ago, I could relate to what Paul Apostles He said, I'm in a difficult spot between two. I, I, I want to stay and be with you, but I want to go on. I remember in the hospital when they told me they didn't know if I'd live through the night or thought I wouldn't live through the night. I remember feeling that way. I was kind of like, I don't know, Lord. <laughs> I'm a little iffy on this thing. <laughs> I'm a little iffy on this thing. Man, it'd be great. <laughs> it'd be great to walk into the presence of the Lord and be there for all eternity. That'd be an awesome thing. But yet at the same time, I thought, I remember saying, Lord, I'd like to see my grandchildren, my future grandchildren. And I've had six since then. Don't be tied too tight to this world. This is an awesome story. As they were walking along together, suddenly a chariot of fire, horses of fire appeared, separated the two of them. Elijah went up to heaven in the world, and man, I want to go out and blaze of glory to God. <laughs> I want to go out and blaze of glory. And Elijah, Elijah saw this and cried out, My father, my father. Interesting. This was not his biological father. I want you to get this this morning because I'm going somewhere with this. My father, my father, he cried out. There's some spiritual fathering to be done. We'll come to that in a minute. My father, my father, the chariots and the horse were the middle. And Elisha saw him no more. And then he took a hold of his clothes and tore them apart. And he picked up the mantle that Elijah was wearing. As Elijah went off in the whirlwind, the mantle came down, and he picked up the mantle that had fallen from Elijah, and he went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan, and he took the mantle that had fallen from him and struck the water. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked, and when he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed the river, just like it had for Elijah. And he knew he had received. Okay. The value of the blessing. The value of the blessing. There's the blessing. Do you have a blessing? Do you have a blessing? Do you have a mantle? I have there. You can't pass one on. You don't have one. We're talking about giving a blessing to our children, our sons or daughters. We're talking about a spiritual mantle. You can't pass one on if you don't have one. Do you have a blessing to give? Do you have a mantle? What is a blessing? Oh, I believe a blessing is the favor, the smile. Daddy would pray for me and say, bless Tom, bless his, his 
his wife, bless his children, bless the things that he owns, take care of his property. What, what, is, a, what is a blessing? I believe it's the smile and the favor of God, and, and I want to pass that along to my sons. I want, I want to, Tommy and Scott and Alan and Kevin to have a, to have a blessing for me, but, but, but i got to have one in order to give it. And then what is a mantle? We've already gone there a little bit. A mantle is a spiritual thing. The Holy Spirit's anointing. And again, I want to repeat, I'm not suggesting that the Holy Spirit is given biologically. No. But I believe that if a son or daughter follow the teachings and the foundational truths and seek to walk in the Spirit and know the Lord, that then the Father can pass along a mantle. It's, it's bigger than a blessing. It's bigger than a blessing. Guys, we, I think, would want to live a life that would bless our sons or daughters, but, but do we have, do we offer them a mantle? A mantle is acquired in close, close walk with the Lord. A mantle is acquired in close walk with the Lord. How is a blessing acquired? Let's go back there. How is a blessing acquired? I said you can't give a blessing if you don't have it. So how is a blessing acquired? I believe a blessing is acquired through faithfulness. Through honoring God in all. My father was a faithful man to the Lord. He wasn't a perfect man. He had his failures. He had his arguments with his wife. My mother. He had his ups and downs. He had his humanity. He wasn't perfect, but he was faithful to God. He would always back up, and he would always correct, and he would always show the Spirit of Christ at the end of the day. There's a difference. He didn't say that we were to be perfect. Word. Usually the word perfect in the King James, it means complete. We don't have our glorified body yet, but God has called us to faithfulness. How is a blessing acquired? Stay with me. You don't get a lot from this. How is a blessing acquired? It's acquired through faithfulness. It's acquired through honoring God in everything. The first fruits. The scripture calls us to give 10% of our income. My dad gave 30% of his income his entire life. What a powerful blessing to pass on. What a powerful principle. He can pray over me with, with, with authority. You can pray over someone with authority if you've got faithfulness to back it up. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth not. A pattern of faithfulness. In James, ask wisdom. Ask in faithfulness. It says ask in faith. You know, in the Greek, it means faith or faithful. In a state of faithfulness. Praying over someone with a faithful life is a powerful prayer. It's an enabling prayer. My dad gave his first fruits. He was faithful. He honored God in all that he did. Christ was first in his life. He had a blessing to give. Those men among us who choose to serve the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength for two various commandments, and then choose to love their neighbors, their self, and this is their car and their, and, their, and their house and their property that's most important. You can see that when you're around them. That when there's a relationship broken, everything else stops. Because the relationship's most important. The man that honors God with the two greatest commandments. That's how a blessing is acquired. It's not some magic potion. It's not something you run off and, and, and acquire by doing a... Uh, uh, this. It's through consistent faithfulness, honoring God in all that you do, putting Christ first, following the two greatest commandments. That's how a blessing is acquired and you can give that blessing away. Can I take an extra break for a second? Stay with me. This is good stuff in media. I said it is very sad. I'm just write one read what I've written here. It is very sad we live in a day when men's roles are changing. Men's roles are changing. And it's very sad. But then I have written, when men step up, things happen. I've seen it in 
this building. When men step up. We've had guys that were just living a life on the couch. And life's just about sports and entertainment. Nothing wrong with some relaxation. In a stressful world, you need some relaxation. Nothing wrong with some entertainment. You need that. But I've seen guys that had a hunger like Elisha in this group. I've seen it in our memory group. And when men step up, things start happening. Men step up and say, I'm going to pursue the pearl of great price. I'm going to stop living for materialism. I start getting texts from wives that say, boy, I don't know what's going on, but this is a good thing. The home starts changing. When men step up, things start happening. Men are discouraged and they're downtrodden. Society's beating them up. You with me? A man is to be a leader. He's to be the priest of the home. He's to live the kind of life that he's got a blessing to offer. We got guys that like to give a blessing, but they ain't got one. They can't give a blessing, let alone a man. They ain't got one. Pardon my anger. But they ain't. They ain't got a blessing. They ain't got a blessing. They haven't got a man. They've given in to the pressures of society. Hear me, hear me, hear me. Look, listen, let me read to you. When men step up, things happen. When they become a leader, when they become an example, when they model God-like characteristics, that doesn't mean they're perfect. When they become priests of the home, they become a motivator. When they become the disciplinarian, when they become the instructor, things start happening in the family. Things start happening in the community. Things start happening in the church and the body of Christ. We've given in to the pressure of society. I have written here, society's pressures are forcing men to live on the couch. Cultural changes are taking away his worth. If he tries to lead and motivate, everybody says he's controlling. He steps up and sticks his head up out of the sand and decides he's going to try to lead a little bit. He's going to try to motivate a little bit. And society tells him, oh, you're controlling. He's just trying to lead. God put it in him. So he gives in and just sits on the couch and goes through the channels. God's calling men to step up. Cultural changes have taken away his worth. When he tries to lead and motivate, he, he had, he's accused of trying to run things or be the boss or be controlling. Hollywood and mass media have in-your-face temptations. And they blamed him in the moral landslide. Let me say that again. Hollywood and mass media with the in-your-face temptations all the time have drained him in the moral landslide. Then I have, I mean, it's just like I have it. Ridiculous government and social pressures have taken away his authority. He can't even leave his children. It's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. In Romans 1, it says, professing to be wise, they become fools. We're the smartest generation ever was, has the greatest technology ever was, and we're acting like absolute idiots. You know what a Haitian pastor said to me, observing? He came over here at the States and observed our jails. And he said, Tom, you can go to the jail as a pastor. I said, yes. They want you to come. They invite you. I said, yes. They want us to visit me. You can take Bible to the jail? Yes. He said, why don't they do that in school so they don't go to the jail? <laughs> So much more educated. He was sincere. He said, Why don't they do it in the school? That would make more sense. Yeah. Yeah. Ridiculous government social pressures have taken his authority. He can't even be over his children. His children and grandchildren are growing up wild, disrespectful. Listen, his children and grandchildren are growing up wild, disrespectful, unruly, and intrusive. But there's nothing he can do about it. <laughs> and I think a lot of times we're critical of guys because they just kind of give in. They got this in them to lead and to be the priest. And I think sometimes we criticize them and the problem is they just give up. <laughs> I just, I'll just watch the coals and the desks, you know, eat my chips and shut up, you know. God's calling warriors. Men that'll seek 
the pearl of great price. This ain't some magic potion, folks. You go for faithfulness and step up and go against the pressures and be the priest of the home. You're going to get a blessing and you'll be able to pass it on. And the good news is, if you've messed up your blessing for the last 20 years, repent up and start over. You can acquire more of a blessing in a year and a half following the Lord than you can 20 years left for the devil. Anybody agree with that? Our society is going down the drain. I have had a sense of sadness that is almost overwhelming that I can't describe to you. I've had periods of sadness that I just feel like I've got 7,500 pounds on my shoulders. I'm saying, Lord, what is this? And the Lord says, I'm opening your eyes to what is happening. And it's birds. God has called us to step up. How is a blessing acquired? Faithfulness. Honoring God. Christ's first, the two greatest commandments. How is a man acquired? Oh, you got to be Jack Robinson. Oh, you get No. Oh, you've got to be some important pastor or preacher that everybody puts on the pedestal. No. Sorry. That's not it. That's not it. That's not even in the equation. You want to have a mantle. The people who get said, I'm sticking with you, buddy. I don't care where you go. I'm going to be right beside you. When you die, I want what you got. I want twice of it. You want to have a mantle? A mantle is formed in intimacy with God. Let me tell you something. Dave Hollins. One of my prayer partners. A lot of you know Dave. Dave had a blessing. He lived faithful. He honored God. Given of his means to the ministry. Put Christ first. I wouldn't have any question that they had a blessing to pass along to Matt and Christy. But eight years ago, he made a commitment that he was going to pray like never before. And he was going to spend Wednesdays praying for me. He was going to spend Mondays praying for another minister. He was going to spend Thursday praying for his grandkids and his family. He was going to spend Friday praying for a guy that runs ministry out in Colorado Springs. And he starts spending intimacy with God. And I'm going to tell you something. That man's got a mantle now. It's bigger than a blessing. And everybody's around him can tell. He got up at his father's funeral and walked back and forth in his own way, the way that he visited, he didn't talk, and everybody in there was in tears. And when it was all said and done, I said, it wasn't the pastors that had the, that had the funeral to Dave. <laughs> the things that Dave had were anointed. They were powerful. And I saw changing that man. He went from just having a blessing to having a mantle. And I love a mantle. A blessing's a good thing. I want to pass along a blessing. Absolutely. But I want a mantle. I want a mantle. I want to have something that people realize, man, I don't know if that guy's God, but I want part of that. For sure, I want to have a mantle. And God has that for you, and that is acquired through intimacy and time with God. It will form slowly. It will form in its own way. It's not about being a preacher or a prophet. It's about closeness with God, and closeness with God will bring a mantle in your life. Passing on a blessing. Passing on a blessing. Look, look for your heir. Look for the person that God wants you to give a blessing. Sometimes, this is sensitive. We all love our families. Sometimes, the person you want to give it to. And I believe it. Stay with me. Stay with me. God gave me this three months ago. So it's got to be for this moment. I never had messages out of it. Sometimes the person you want to give it to, that you want to give it to, doesn't want it. Ouch. I know of a family. Someone his own one. The only son went his own way. He didn't want the blessing. He wanted to choose as the scripture speaks. He'd rather live in wickedness, in the old English it says, than to have his fellowship with the Lord. He, he, he wanted the things of lust and, and pursued those things. And I, and, and I know of a family 
that I observed and I saw this before my eyes that, uh, oh, the Father absolutely had a blessing. The Father had a mantle, but the Son did not want it. In fact, in this particular case, the Son despised the mantle. And I saw the Lord give that mantle to the grandson. If you're living for God, you've got a blessing. And if you're walking with Him, you've got a mantle. Give it to somebody. Samuel said, quit grieving over Saul and anoint David. Quit grieving over Saul and anoint David. And I've had fathers in that sense of conversation. They said, I prayed and prayed and prayed for my son. For their salvation, keep holding on to the horns of the altar. Keep praying at the mercy seat. Keep asking God to say, Lord, I got a blessing and it's forming and it's filling me and it's going to burst. Who do I give it to? There are a hundred thousand young men and women who have lost their way that would kill to have a father. Are you with me? Amen. I can't tell you the young men and women I know that desperately want a father. I don't know why that's so powerful to me this morning, but I've got to be who I am and let God work through me in that manner. But that came to me forcefully, and I felt from my head to my feet when I said it a moment ago. Samuel said, quit reading over Saul and anoint David. God said the same. Quit grieving over Saul. Now, let me put that in context. Do we quit praying for our wayward son and daughter? Oh, no, no. That's the prayer on our lips at our last moment. But it's a choice, and the human will is one of the most powerful things in the world. And sometimes you have someone you want to give your blessing to, and they don't want it. For whatever reason, they're bitter, they're angry, they've gone away, they don't want it. Give it to somebody. And I see some of you doing that. I see some of you that would die for your son or daughter, but to this point in time, they've chosen another direction. And you're giving your mantle. And I see you do it. I see men that look to you like a son. I'm not going to go in names, but I see in this congregation. And in this new season of return of the Lord, the, moving toward that, you've got to buy into this and understand that, that many have lost their way and need a father. Somebody wants your mantle. And in this one family I described, the son didn't want it, and God gave it to the grandson. And it was obvious he gave it to the grandson. You say, I'm not sure that's scriptural. Oh, isn't it? They wandered in the wilderness and God said, you wouldn't believe me and take the promised land the blessing. So you're all going to die off and I'm going to give it to your kids. I'm going to give it to your kids. And I've had people, I just want to grab and shake and say, I see your daughter, your daughter's son. I see what's happened. I know you're heartbroken. Pray for him till death, till you come to death's door. But give your mantle to somebody. There's people out there that would die to have a mantle. There's a license out there to say, oh, if you'd even suggest I could have your mantle, I would stick to you like glue. I would go everywhere you go. I will not need you. <laughs> and if you've got somebody that's like, ah, oh, now there's no that just it sounds like a pain to me. Sorry, partner, you're missing the big picture. My father, Jack Robbins, wasn't a perfect man. I'm going to tell you something. That man had a blessing and he had a mantle and I wanted it. He had a blessing and he had a mantle and I wanted it. Did he make mistakes? He had three nervous breakdowns. Did he drive off to Arkansas one time, 900 miles away, and not tell us until he got there? His nurse was so shot, he got lost, didn't know where he was. He was a man depressed. He had all kinds of issues. But I'm going to tell you something. That man had an anointing that I still don't understand. God put on him. I believe it's rooted in his surrender. He was a very nice looking man. Very nice looking man, movie star material, seriously. And he had a terrible problem with pride and lust. And he told God when he first came to God that if God wanted to disfigure his face, because he had women at him all the time, he said, if God wanted, he said, God, if you want to disfigure my face, it's okay. I want to honor you and I will not put up with his name. He, he made a level of commitment that was incredible. And with a level of com commitment that's incredible, comes an incredible anointing. And when you get that serious, Pastor, I think that's pretty strong. Oh, is it? Hebrews 12 says, You have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin. That's true stuff. When we get real serious about God, real serious, there comes 
a blessing on our life. And there comes a mantle. Who would like to have your mantle? I believe every godly man has a blessing. And I believe there is someone he is to give it to. But I don't think I'm about finished. So I guess I am, yes, give your blessing to someone who wants it. Esau despised his birthright. Esau despised his birthright. Now Jacob was deceptive. And his mom was in on it. And I don't understand all that. But I do believe Jacob wanted to bless him. <laughs> he wanted to know. <laughs> and I don't, I, I don't buy into the, the, the means justified by the end. I don't, I don't agree with that. But he wanted it. Esau, on the other hand, despised his birthright. And sometimes as cold as that is, you have people who despise. I, 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 I don't want to be that. I don't, I'm not talking about personality. Or we might have traits. or I'm sure I have traits that my boys would want. And, and I, my father had traits in his emotions that I guess I wouldn't want that exact same trait just like that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you. I'm talking, I'm talking about a spiritual Esau despised his birthright. Quit grieving over Saul and go anoint David. And I believe that this message is very timely on Father's Day because I believe God is sending us a multitude of people that are looking for a father. And it's not just a father, help me with this, help me fix my car, help me with that. That, that stuff matters. It's an Elisha, Elijah, oh my father, he cried, oh my father. Oh, my father, what's your mantle? There are people looking for a spiritual father. So older men here today, who, who would God assign you? I don't know those things. I don't know if I'm not to dictate those things. But I know I'm in a season I never saw coming. I thought once we had boys raised, that's pretty much it. You know, you just kind of retired and enjoy the golden years. Yeah. What would I not eat? You know what, though? I'm enjoying this season. And someone asked me the other day, what's your favorite season in life? I thought, well, I said, now. I think it's now. I'm closer to the Lord than I've ever been. And God brought something that I didn't see coming. My boys are raised, grandchildren coming on, and God is bringing me young men and women who need a spiritual father. And I did not see that coming. Honestly, I can say that, having made myself available for that, I probably have 20 or 25 people. I'd have to count them. I pray for them many times. But I probably just have to, I probably have 20 or 25 people that I know for a fact consider me a second father to them. That's not because I'm anything special. God has some of you. We have generations lost their way. The men have given up. Can you see that? The men have given up. There's still a desire in them to be a warrior. There's still a desire in them to, to be a motivator. There's still a desire in them to intercede and be priest of the home because they know in their heart of hearts because of how God made that they're supposed to be. But they're scared to open their mouth and society's pushing us back in the corner and, and, and men are just giving up. And then you get blamed for it. You don't do nothing. Well, you don't want it. You get fired. Don't worry. I don't know if you're tired or not. It's a mass problem. When I get in talks with men who all do sit on the couch, when I start talking about things that can happen in their life, I see a light come in their eyes. I do. I see a light come in their eyes that wasn't there before. Because deep within them, under all those layers, is a desire to be a motivator. Deep within them is a desire to push ahead, to make something, to, to create. God put that in. God's a creator. He, society just keeps pushing them farther back, farther back, farther back. Men. Step up. Step up. Do you have a blessing? Do you have a mantle? How far do you have you out? 11.35 and it's 11.45. Let's stand together for prayer.